Good morning. Yeah, see, I got you trained now. It's like I, he's going to say it again if you don't stop. So I, I get the fourth se- of the series of Grounded in the Gospel. So one of the things that I, I, I think um, Pastor Mike always steers us away of speaking Christianese. So then what is the gospel? And so I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll ask some really, I'll, I'll figure out a way to ask this. So I said, hey, S-I-R-I, I don't want to set everybody's phone off. Um, what is the gospel? And you know what it said? The same thing I learned in Bible school. It's the good news. It's the good news, right? Oh, kids, sorry. Whoa, I'm getting waved. Kids, you can go back. Now that they've got the gospel down. So, <laughs> so it's the good news. And so we should c- kind of treat it that way, right? is we think about the gospel in itself of being the good news. Now, there's some other things that we are going to talk about today, and one of them is discipleship. Now, we hear a lot in our church that we do what? We make disciples who? But what's that mean? Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of right. I, I think you're probably right. But so we got to use the good news to make disciples. So I'm going to back up just a second and, and tell you something about good news. I was in a meeting with Pastor John just recently, and um, he just had a grandbaby. And I knew he had just had a grandbaby because it was on Facebook, so it had to be real. And it was on Facebook. So um, we're sitting in the meeting, and I'm literally going, I wonder how long it's going to take for him to go, I got a grandbaby, right? And sure enough, you could see it in his eyes when he comes into it, hey, I had a grandkid. And I was like, really? That, that, really? I didn't know that. He's showing me pictures. So, of course, I'm a grandpa, so I got to pull out my pictures of my grandkids and show him the pictures of my grandkids. But when you have good news, right, you want to share it. I mean, you, you want to grab the good news and you want to tell everybody around you about that good news. Sharing the gospel is a lot like just sharing good news. So then we talk about discipleship. And you know, when I was a youth, I had a youth pastor. His name was John Jacob Toby Tobin Jr. Now, the funny thing is, I just looked him up on Facebook, and the man is old. Sorry, John, or Toby. He went by Toby. Um, but I was trying to think about, well, I was 16, and he was like 20 years older than me. And, I, and what he said to me about discipleship has stuck with me my entire life. And it's amazing how these little things that people tell you that just stick with you. So get this. Here's what he said. He said, people make decisions every single day. We rejoice when someone decides that they, that they accept Jesus, right? I mean, the angels in heaven rejoice. But being a disciple takes action. It takes something more than just coming to church. Sorry. It does. It means that you have to share this good news. And how you do this is with action. Now, I can remember him telling the youth group and look at me, and, and I, was, I was like, I don't understand this. What do you mean by it's different? And, and he sat down with me and he said, listen, here's the deal. I do. I rejoice every time someone accepts Jesus. But when I see the action of Jesus in their life over time and the ability for them to share it with other people, that's discipleship. It's, it's the ability to do that. And I think it's kind of funny because I, I was telling Patricia before service that um, that you know, just, you know, this is a great spot to say something. And she goes, I don't feel qualified. How many of you feel like that in your life that sometimes when you talk about sharing Jesus, you just don't feel qualified, right? And so, and I always appreciate when people are really honest and they just say that and they go, well, you know, I just don't feel qualified about this. But if you talk about people and you're doing this in love and you're sharing Jesus in love, they're going to know it. It's going to be a real thing, and that is going to drive me absolutely insane. I have no idea what it is. Um, So the biggest thing is is we want to be a church that can walk the walk and talk the talk. We want to be Christians who can walk the walk and talk the talk. Now, that's not always easy. It's not always an easy thing to just say, okay, listen, now that I'm a Christian, now I'm invested. Now, I did something after the women's retreat, and I did it on per- or after the women's thing, and I did it on purpose. If you look around the auditorium, this is how it's set up before COVID. Every, there's 180 seats out in this, in this auditorium. We counted them. We sat and counted them after we got them up. We put them this way for a reason. 
And I'm gonna and I'm gonna challenge you coming up that these seats that you are the disciples that can fill these seats. Because I got asked this week, why is it that the church isn't full? And I said, well, I don't know. It's a good question. But we have things to offer, and you have things to offer, and I think that that's going to be an amazing thing to see God's, God fulfill this. So we want to be that way. It matters. When we put energy into things, when we actually are authentic, it matters. It absolutely does. And so it, it, you don't have to be Chris Christian. That's what we used to call it in the 80s, is Chris Christian. You just have to be you, and you have to be authentic. You can, if you're not having a good day, nobody says you got to smile and, you know, oh, praise Jesus type thing. That, that's not what God wants you to do either, because guess what? If you're having a bad day, there are people around you that can help you with your bad day. If you're honest and you work things through. Because the one thing that, that people ask about living water that's different is I say, I think we have real people who have real problems, who sometimes are afraid to share it, but once they share it, they can get things worked out. And so that, that's really a good thing to do. So real discipleship is what we want. Amen? Okay. So we get that. And then, so the effort that it takes, and then we start looking. We're going to continue to look at the life of Paul, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Paul and David are both, those, are, those guys are tied in the Bible. He was a great teacher, but he's just an amazing person. And we're going to continue to dig into this. And we want to see what the vision of this church is and the vision of the church is, right? We want to actually grab a hold of that and say, okay, Lord, where do we fit into this? So let's pray. Father, you are amazing. And I just pray that you would set me aside and let your Holy Spirit fill this place. Lord, say the things that you want said, Lord, and just anoint every ear that's listening. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in your name. Amen. All right. Stop it. Okay, there we go. Sorry. Okay, so... If you have a Bible, just go to 1 Thessalonians and put your finger there because we're going to go all over 1 Thessalonians. You can have, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll be glad to give you one. If you don't have it, you can keep it. Looking, looking, looking. Everybody's got what they need. Oh, there's a Bible in the back. Jeffrey, where'd you go? Raven, Raven's going to hook you up. So. so we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is a letter that Paul's writing to the church of Thessalonia. And that's going to be a tongue twister. So where's Patricia? Because she helped me with my tongue twister the other day. So it's going to be a tongue twister when we talk about this. But they're talking about the church of Thessalonia. Now, Paul is an amazing man who knows how to bring love to the church. And so that's where we're setting at this point. And he writes a letter to the church as he was not there. And so he's trying to encourage them. And the reason why he wasn't there was because, well, they were going to kill him. So him and Silas said, hey, we're going to take off and we're going to get out of here. But this is where it takes up in 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through 20. I'll give you a second to get there because I, I like to rapid fire these things. But, you know, you look at this particular point and when Paul talks to the, the church of Corinth, he's just an amazing, inspiring person. And he does this in great love. And so here's the letter that comes to it. Dear brothers and sisters, after we have been separated for a little while, although our hearts have never left you, we, cried, we, we, we tried hard to come back, but because of intense longing, and, and we tried hard to be, come back because of intense longing and to see you again. We wanted so much to come to you. Um, I, Paul, tried again and again, but, but Satan prevented us. After all, what gives us hope and joy, what, what we will be proud of, our proud reward and the crown that we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ returns, it is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. Now, I don't know about you, but my grandma used to, I, I used to tell people that, you know, you got to be careful because my grandma, I'm the, I'm the firstborn and I was her pride and joy. And as far as she was concerned, every step I did, there was gold that was inside of there. And so I, I teased about that, but some of my friends, when I said that, they went, oh, she really does feel that way, doesn't she? When you have that intense longing to be with someone and that they are your pride and joy, it's something that you like to do, what's called face-to-face. -face. He's saying, I can't be there, but I would really like to be here face-to-face -to, -face to see you. I would really like to be there because it means more to me to be face-to-face. -to -face. 
Now, discipleship's going to be a lot like this, face-to-face stuff, so don't get scared. It's going to be okay. It's really, it's really, it's going to be okay, I promise. But they, they want to actually hear the good news, and they want to cur- encourage each other. Now, that's hard to do in a letter, right? If you don't believe it, read Facebook sometime and get encouraged from it. No? Or write a letter, and, you know, I always tell people that letters are very flat affect, Right? They don't feel your inflection. You can write kind of gushy and stuff, but they're pretty flat affect. Discipleship face-to-face is an amazing thing to do because really what people want to see is real people with real problems with a real solution. Who's the solution? Where's the solution? It's not living water, by the way, right? This building can go away today, and his good news is going to continue to go because you guys can keep spreading it, right? So this is a great building. We love our building. But the fact is that face-to-face stuff is really good. I was still encouraged this week as I was talking to the women's ministry. By the way, I got blessed again. I showed up at the women's ministry event. So those of you who didn't, I did sound. I wasn't just showing up to sit at the tables. <laughs> so, the, so those of you who didn't, you really missed out on an amazing thing. It was, and so I, I was encouraged that this face-to-face stuff, when they had table time, it was face-to-face talking about real-life things. She had some amazing. Amber, those were great questions that sat down, and to try to break those women up was almost impossible. Carrie may try with no microphone. But face-to-face discipleship is something that's really cool, and it's something that's pretty easy to do. Paul says, after we've been separated for you for a time, though our hearts never left you, that we tried to come with intense longing again. Now, they knew that if they showed up, what was going to happen? they were going to be killed. It's not like Paul hadn't fought, had persecution before, but if he's dead, it's really hard to be an encourager at that point. So, but he really wanted this face-to-face, I just want to see your eyes, I want to talk to you. Now, I have to tell you the first time that we preach, um, anybody preaches, you have to preach in front of Mike first. Pastor Mike, sorry. You have to, and, and face-to-face, one-on-one, is pretty scary. But he's a great encourager. So I'm like going like this, kind of, you know, not knowing what he's going to say. And he's like, well, that was really good. Let's break that down. And by the time I was done, I was completely encouraged. But that could only happen. He could have written me an email and said, hey, you know, I read your, your, your notes. They look great. But that interaction that we had face to face is what created this discipleship that we're talking about. It's just spending time with each other. Paul's really heartfelt. He wants to be there. With everything within him, he wants to be there with this church. It's a young church. He doesn't want it to make mistakes. He doesn't want it to trip up. But he's hearing some good things too. And so he just wants to encourage them. So, you know, the funny thing is, is if you're grounded in the gospel, you learn things. And nobody expects you to just become a disciple overnight. No one does. So I voluntold Isaac for a little demonstration on discipleship. You you like how voluntold works? So... So I'm a CrossFitter. I CrossFit. And the running joke about CrossFit is? No, 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 that's not it. The running joke about CrossFit is if if you CrossFit, they're going to tell you that they CrossFit. It's going to come out in the first couple of paragraphs of it. it, You know, we'll start talking and it's like, oh yeah, I do this CrossFit thing. It's amazing. I really like it. I was 305 pounds when I started. I lost 100 pounds doing it. And it's just a great thing and you can't stop talking about CrossFit. Okay? CrossFit comes with instruction. So this is a med ball. This is what we call a med ball. It's 20 pounds. And it's an instructional phase of the very beginning parts of CrossFit. It's what we build on. This will teach you how to put the bar up to your throat and you get underneath the the bar, right? So I can do it. Isaac, you're going to watch me, okay? Face to face, all right? All right. Okay, your turn. <clears throat> oh, did that look the same? Oh, it didn't. Okay, Isaac, we're going to do a couple of things. Now, I'm just going to help you with this. Okay, it's super easy to do. I want you to grab the ball. When you come up, I want you to shrug your shoulders, and I don't want the ball to come above your belt, and I want you to come under the ball. Okay? okay. All right. Not above my belt. Yep. Uh, maybe your belly button. Good. All right. Good. Thank you. All done. That was amazing. You're awesome, Sasha. Okay? 
So here's what we tell people in CrossFit. Anybody can do CrossFit. The first thing that comes into your mind when somebody says CrossFit is, oh, that's too intense for me. I've heard you're going to get hurt. Shut up. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt when you do that. But when you walk into CrossFit, and I came up through what we call Globo Gym, that comes to, anyways, it doesn't matter. We call, we, I came in from the first time I opened up the door, right? I open up the gym and I look and I go, there's treadmills, there's Stairmasters, there's all this other stuff. So I walk in and I look and the only thing I know how to do is get on a treadmill. Because nobody's going to instruct me. There's nobody there to do it. So I just walk on a treadmill for a while. And then I go, workout done. Woo, good. So the interesting thing about CrossFit is, is we teach a class called fundamentals. And this is one of the fundamentals. Um, it's not fair because Isaac's actually a personal trainer. So I, I just want to, you know, I coached him to mess it up, okay? So um, we, we teach a fundamentals class. This is one of our fundamentals with our nine basic moves that we do. And I always, I love teaching these classes, by the way. So you get these brand new people in front, and they look at the gym and they go, yikes. And then by the time we get done with the third class of fundamentals, they're like, yeah, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. Now, I've been doing CrossFit for nine years. I started when I was 50 years old. Two years ago, I started coaching. And I love it. I love coaching. I love finding those little things where people get ahas. You see where I'm going with this? This is the gospel. This is how you share the gospel. It took me just a couple of seconds and a little bit of encouragement, and he could walk out and do that med ball. He could go out onto the gym floor and do that med ball with just a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of instruction. You don't have to be qualified. You are qualified. That's a word I made up for men's ministry. I just made it up. So... So just go with me, and I'm going to say it with intenseness and try to look it up on Siri, and it's not going to be there. But So really, that's how we share the power of God, is we get excited about this. Now I look back a little bit later after someone's been on the floor for a while. We call the gym the floor. They've come on the floor for a while. They've worked out for a while. And as a coach, I'm excited that I get to work out with them. You see, a lot of the times I don't get to do that because I'm coaching them, because I want them to do it right. I want them to, to do it right because I don't want them to get hurt. I don't want too much intensity. So when the new people are there, I just coach. And then I go work out later. Now my morning guys, they're all trained up so I get to work out with them. And it's always they, uh, my, the owner of the gym and the coach laughs because they all circle me. Because that's how I, when we coach, you get them nice and tight. And, you, and the people who knew how to do it all the time, they were doing it over there. So in reality, if you do this, if you work this through, you're going to be able to do face-to-face -face instruction, and it's going to be sharing the gospel. And you can use little things just like that to be able to do it. So what, he's, what they're talking about is, is you start looking at church on Sunday, and you start thinking to yourself, um, I got this, right? So here's the funny thing about people who start CrossFit is they'll get through fundamentals, and they'll think, I'm good. I'm going to get a home gym, and I'm going to go, and I don't need any instruction anymore. I'm just going to get a home gym and I'm going to go. So later on, I might see them somewhere. I'm like, hey, man, we missed you at church. No CrossFit. We missed you. And we said, you know, what's going on? Well, I got this home gym. How's it going for you? Well, I haven't worked out for a really long time. And so, you know, the, the kind of joke is, is people get this great intentions, right? And they buy a stair mill and they buy a stair master. And then pretty soon it hangs clothes around the outside of it. And if you're really smart, you can get the, the treadmill to deliver clothes for you. <laughs> right? And so, but in reality, are they getting a good workout? No. So that's kind of like church. Is we think we got it, we can stay home and watch it on YouTube. We can stay here and watch it on YouTube. Now, are you going to get some instruction with that? Yep, you are. Are you going to get face-to-face -face time? No. Are you going to get shoulder time? That's what I call it. So originally when we started men's coffee, I did it with the intent of just getting guys to know each other. We, have you seen one announcement about men's coffee up there? No. Because we just one-on-one, -on -one, face on face, the challenge to them is say, hey, look, I, I, we have this men's coffee thing. We just come and we talk. And let me tell you, some things change there. It's a pretty amazing conversation that happens at those men's coffees. And it's with intent. So we, we definitely want to look at the church and we say, listen, we need 
instruction, and we need shoulder time, and we need people to walk us through this. And we need to be in a circle with each other, and we call that chairs. But, but we need to be with each other because we can't experience this whole thing without it. So the, you, you start looking at things like, oh, I'm good, I don't need church on Sundays, or whatever may be there. But in reality, if you talk to somebody and you're trying to disciple them and you reach out and you go, hey, you know, I, I, we have this great church we go to and their excuses are what? I, I can name them all. Oh, you know, I've had bad experience with Christians. We'll, we'll try it again, see if it works, you know. Well, no, 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 you know, I, I just, I'm just not good enough to come to church. If that's the case, I shouldn't be here every Sunday. I'm broken in need of a Savior. And so, what, but what, if we look at what Hebrews says, it gives us a little bit of instructions to help us with that. Let us hold tightly without, without wavering, with hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate each other. And can you do that online from YouTube? We can when we have to, but it's easier face-to-face, -face, right? To motivate each other and not neglect meeting together as people do, but to encourage one another, especially now in the time that draws near. So listen, the honest thing is, is we need to encourage each other. We need to say, I've been where you are. I know exactly what's going on. I've been where you are. I've, I, I've felt the same way. But, you know, and, and people will use that. And I just, I use an analogy that um, I think my grandpa or a friend taught, taught me once was God makes us fishers of men, but we let him clean them. Come as you are. Come as you are. He makes us fishers of men, but we let him clean them. We, we just need to accept and love people, right? That's, that's the good news is that you're accepted, that you're loved. So um, it also takes time to invest in each other and to speak into each other's lives. Paul's amazing at investing in each other. He's amazing at investing in the church. Is it going to be easy? The answer is no. It's not going to be easy. Are you going to get discouraged? The answer is yes. How are you going to get the encouragement? Tell somebody you got discouraged. Reach out. Say, I don't get it. Uh, Andrew and I uh, hang out a little bit, and, and he's always amazed that I just start talking to people and because uh, he's an introvert. But he's like, I can't believe you did that. And he's just like, you know, and Isaac's a lot like this too. We've never met a stranger. So it's like you, you just don't meet strangers because that's the way that we can love on people. You're dealing with people, and people are difficult. People are broken. People are in need of a Savior, but discipleship's easy. I'm broken in need of a Savior. I'm no better than you. I'm no worse than you. I need Jesus every single day. Paul says it when he says, look, I have to renew myself daily, right? I'm, I'm in need of a Savior every single day. It's pretty amazing. Is there a way to speed up discipleship? The answer is no. There's no way to speed up from a med ball to a clean. You can't speed it up. You have to go through processes or you're going to hurt yourself. So discipleship takes time. It takes shoulder time. When, when Toby said that to us as a youth group and said, hey, you know, this is discipleship. Discipleship is, is not easy. It takes action. It takes you deciding that you're going to represent Jesus, that you're going to do this every single day. It's not easy. It takes time. But you know what? The payoff is amazing. It's amazing. Just like this med ball, where I could walk Isaac through messing it up to the where he's got it. And when he walks off the stage, he goes, yeah, I got that. You know? I felt it before. Squat cleans, I was scared to death of squat cleans. That's what this thing gets you ready for. I was afraid the bar was going to bust my face open. I was afraid I was going to fall over backwards. All of those things have happened to me. Just kidding. But, but I was afraid of it. But if I go back to the fundamentals, the basic of the good news or the basic of the med ball, I can share that and go, okay, I know I messed something up. I'm going back to the basis. I am broken and need of a Savior. And Jesus can do something with that. The moment, the moment I think I got everything together, what happens? <laughs> right? Uh, and, that, and that's the fact. It's going to take time. It's going to take developing relationships. Okay? So now this only happens to me, so just ignore it and just let me babble for a second. 
This would never happen to you guys. Here comes Sunday morning. We forget that we have an enemy at work, right? And this enemy does not want you in these seats. What I say? He does not want you in these seats. So you start off on Sunday morning getting ready and something happens at home and you get in an argument. Fine, I'm not going to go. And you use that for an excuse not to come to church. Or the sun's out. S-U-N. Well, the sun's out in here. S-O-N. So we can figure that out, right? And so really, if you think about it, this is all going to take time. And if we genuinely love people, guess where they're going to be? Right here on Sunday mornings. Because they feel genuine love, right? So Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, we wanted very much to come to you, but I tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. Now, what did he use to prevent him from coming? Everybody wanted to kill him. And so he knew that he couldn't do it. And so here's this deal. They're all speaking bad against him. And Satan prevented him to do this. Listen, we do have an enemy. And people, it's time to recognize that and know that you can bind that enemy just like that. The Bible says that you can bind him. And so you need to recognize that when things start, this, those snary type things come up on Sunday morning, you got to go, okay, hold on a second. Or every morning, yeah. You got to go, okay, hold on a second. Listen, the, this is not, I need to be in church. And so recognize where you got to go with this. And, and guess what? I guarantee you that you'll be blessed. Push through. That's a, that's a CrossFit thing too. We tell people all the time, pick up the bar and push through. Pick it up. Let's go. Jennifer's going, amen. So. <laughs> so you know how it goes too. You know, you sign up for life group. Something happens. And you go, mm, yeah, I don't really know that I want to hang out with those people. And then you go, I signed up, but I don't want to go. No, I got to tell you that Rooted, I had a rough group in Rooted. I had Pastor Mike. I had Jeff Watchman. I had all the leadership as my Rooted group. And we were honest with each other. Lots of things came into it during the week that we didn't want to be there. But guess what? Every single, I could not stop crying. I'm not a crier. I, you can ask Pastor Mike. I cried every single time we went to Rooted. I was like this babbling baby because Jesus was touching me because I pushed through. You, you just got to push through. You guys got this, all right? I can teach you how to do this. I guarantee you I can walk you through discipleship because you're already equipped because you are qualified. Every single one of you, all right? So it's good. So what we need to recognize is those, those little snares are there, right? Jeff kind of alluded to some other snares that might be there, too, is, is like driving. Now, I, I have to tell you that um, I'm not as bad as Pastor Mike at this. <coughs> I might have a little road rage, but, but not really. It's just when they drive slow and cut you off, right? So your urge when you're driving, when that happens, is to wave with less than all fingers. <laughs> so just to wave with less than all fingers or whatever you mouth may not be edifying. I'm just saying. There's all kinds of other things that come in there that may, and then you start thinking about, oh, look what I did. I just blew it. I completely blew my, my everything. And in reality, that's the enemy whispering in your ear that you're not good enough. You are good enough. You're human. And so you're going to make mistakes. I don't like people who drive slow either, Pastor Mike, just so you know. So try, <laughs> drives me nuts. So so what we want to make sure that we do is we just don't fall into those snares. We, we start working on each other. We, we leave five minutes earlier so that we have a little bit of time to take a deep breath and you're not stuck in those spots. Recognizing his snares is really important because have you guys ever seen a rabbit snare? Okay. So if you've set rabbit snares before, you know exactly what they are. You've got these little twigs that push them right into the, to the snare, right? And you know exactly what they are. Same thing with Satan. Start looking for the twigs and go, <laughs> not going there, because I know at the end of it, it's, it's not good. So start looking for those snares, and you, can, and you can do way better. So you want to fight for relationships. It's really important that we fight for relationships. When we started this church, Joey and I, one of my best friends ever, we did set up and tear down. The first thing I said to him was, 
I'm unoffendable. I grew up in a fire station. Isaac's grown, grown up in the military. It's hard to be offended when you get poked at every single day. You get a really hard shell with that. But in reality, when you start thinking about it, is we want to encourage and fight the fight with this whole thing. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, after all, what gives us hope and joy, hope and joy, and what to be proud of your reward and the crown when you stand before Jesus, it is you and it is the pride and joy. Just imagine this, folks. If everybody felt like you were their pride and joy, uh, you, they walk through the door and legitimately you go, oh man, I'm so glad to see you. I was thinking about you this week and it just makes me happy that you're here. You, you know, you're my pride and joy. To be the pride and joy of Jesus is going to be something that's really important. Someday Jesus is going to ask you. He's going to say, what'd you do? What relationships do you build? And what do we want to hear? Well done, that good and faithful servant. And it starts with relationships. It starts with relationships and just having that relationship with one another. So much fun to have relationships with people. It, it, it is. But people are broken and needed of a Savior. In chapter 3, we break down chapter 3 a little bit because I think it's really important because it points to everything that we're just talked about. He's in 1 Thessalonians 3. Finally, when we could, not, we could stand no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens and sent Timothy, because at this point, he's going, the letters are not enough. i got to send somebody. I sent Timothy to visit you. He is your brother in God, co-worker proclaiming God's good news or the gospel, right? So he's going to stand. So Paul goes, look, I can't be there. They don't quite have Timothy down the same way they got me down, so I'm going to send Timothy because you need an encourager. You need somebody face-to-face -face at this point. When he sent them to strengthen and encourage them in faith and keep them from being shaken in times of trouble um, that you were going through, he sent somebody to do what? Be face to face. A letter didn't work. Timothy needs to be face to face with you. But you alone, but I'm sorry, but you know that we were disdained from such troubles, detained, sorry. Um, each while we were, we were with you, we warned you and troubles that soon soon to come. And then and they did as well known. So that we start talking about this and we start looking at discipleship. We know that we're here, we know you're in times of trouble. So what we're going to do is we're gonna send someone there to disciple you, to spend a little bit of time showing you how to throw a med ball. We left you in the middle of the process because there were things in the way. We left you in the middle of a process, and now we want to get somebody there to get you through the process. Now, this can be done in a couple of different ways. It can, and the, the second point is influence versus power. Now, we can change things. We can change things in many different ways. A leader can do things in influence or power. So look at how this works. Here's the difference between the two. Power seeks to control your behavior. Influence seeks to change your heart. Have you ever had a leader that tried to do it in power? Did you like them? But if you had one that was right there in the streets with you, who that could influence and could love on you and show you the right way to do it and not make you feel like you're dumb. You know, when, you first, when we first started this, Jeff said, well, he's, you know, he's been in EMS longer. I'm actually a paramedic, but um, he's been in, in this longer. I've been doing this 40 years in, in EMS and stuff. My goal now is to, to really influence these guys so that when I leave, they take the torch. I want to influence them. I want to show them how to walk the walk and talk the talk. And so we really want to be influencers, don't we? We want to motivate by example. We want to be there right with them, and we want to walk them through the processes. That's discipleship. That's, that's kind of discipleship in itself. So what he did in 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, and 3 is, is that he wanted to strengthen and encourage their faith and keep you from shaking in troubles and times. Look, are we in bad times? Are there rough times? Do you need someone to encourage you every once in a while? Yeah, you do. And so really, this is the place to get that. Not only that, folks, but there's men's and women's ministries. There's going to be life groups coming up. There's going to be all of these things where you can have these smaller groups that can, that can really help you through tough times. 
Don't be afraid to sign up for those. Don't be afraid to get involved. Don't be afraid to lead. Don't be afraid to lead. We need leaders. You guys are all leaders. You are qualified. You can do this. You can disciple people. We're going to be there right hand in hand with you. And so when things get tough, you're going to have a phone to pick up and go, hey, man, this really, I don't understand this. And somebody will be there to walk through. Paul and Silas couldn't do this themselves, so they send Timothy because they trust him. I have no doubt that I could send Chris, Isaac, anybody that I paid row and say, hey, I need you to take care of this. Can you do it? One of the best people that I know of that's done that is sitting in the front row right over here. If you're a ministry lead, you take care of your ministry. You take care of the people in your ministry. If they're having a hard time, you can certainly bounce it off him. He's going to say, you're there. You disciple them. Go help. But I'm going to make you qualified and qualified by having somebody there to help you out. There have been a lot of times where I didn't know what to do that I just reached out with somebody and got perspective. Timothy is going to give them perspective. And he's going to hold their hand and say, hey, you guys are on the right track, but just let me just get you a little bit more mature. That's the key, right, in discipleship is to start creating maturity in this and start really looking at things through the lenses of we're in this together. And, and you know, I keep qu quoting rooted stuff, but you are the church. You cannot, you cannot think that the pastor of the church is going to touch every heart that needs to be touched, but you can. You can. And so, I mean, there's so much. I, I've seen his schedule before. It's worse than mine. And so, you know, the, but the bottom line is, is, is his heart's there to disciple. All of the pastor's hearts are there to disciple you. We can't do it by ourselves, but guess what? You can. So we can be your Timothy. We can come where you're at, and we can, we can encourage you. And we can say, hey, listen, I want to be your Timothy. I, I, I want to come and give you some really good news. So action changes things. So we, we start talking about, again, making a decision. You guys make decisions every day, right? I'm going to get up. I'm going to drive. Uh, your kid's going to ask you, hey, can I wear this dress? And you're going to go, no. Pretty easy to see, says, says dad. Best ones go right down to the ankle. So anything else is a, nope, sorry, can't wear it. I'm going to ask mom. You're going, no, 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 right? We can make decisions, but actions what backs it up being able to, to, to do that. Decisions are somewhat easy to do, right? But the action of the follow-through is really tough. I'm going to go a little bit slow and break down 1 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 13. And, uh, and again, we're going to look, use these little actions and discipleship. But now, ha, now Timothy has returned, bringing good news uh, about your faith and love. So after Timothy goes out, he goes, look, their action is good. And he brings it back because Paul needs to hear this because he's like Papa Paul. He needs to know that everything's okay. Timothy he trusts, he sends him out. And he goes, look, I need some action to this. He reports to say, he, his, he reports that you are always to remember your visit of joy and that, that you want to see as much as we want to see you. So we want to see each other, but we want to be joyful in how we do this. Now listen, if I was preaching and I didn't have any joy, you wouldn't like it very much. And it's not me. I have a lot of joy. So Timothy's saying, hey, these guys really are digging this disciple thing. And he's reporting back that there's, there's joy in this. And so as he does that, he reported back and he says, look, I, I'm greatly encouraged in the midst of troubles and sufferings, dear brothers and sisters, because you have remained strong in your faith. This took solid discipleship to be strong in your faith. There is going to be things that jump in front of you every single day. Someone's going to pass away. Something bad's going to happen and you can try to blame it or you can fall back on what you already know and you can say, listen, what I know is, is I've got people who love me who will walk me through this and that's what I need to use. So we can disciple each other as well as disciple somebody who doesn't know the good news. It's just solid dis discipleship. It gives us life to know that you're standing firm in the Lord. So here's Paul. He's just excited that the church is doing okay without him. That's what we want for our kids too, right? We want our kids to do okay without him. I want the fire department to do okay without me when I leave. 
And then when I look back later and go, okay, I did good. I, I taught them what they were supposed to know. And so now I can be the Homer Simpson thing that goes back into the bushes. And they can take it from here and take the, take the torch. Um, let's see, because of you, uh, we have great joy as we enter God's presence. Night and day, we pray earnestly for you, asking God to let us see you again and fill the gaps of your faith. Do we have gaps in our faith? Absolutely. But the, in, that's the prayer right there, right? To fill the gaps in our faith. And how are we going to do that with each other? I mean, that's the bottom line of the whole thing. So we're going to fill those gaps in our faith. May God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, um, bring us to you very soon. He still wants to do face-to-face -face time. He still wants to be there face-to-face, -face, but he can't. And may the Lord make you, uh, may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow, just as our love over, for you overflows. May he, as a result, make your heart strong and blameless and, the, and, and holy as you stand before God, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, until he comes um, again. All his holy people say amen. So if you, if you look at this whole thing, the bottom line is he just wants to make sure, Papa Paul wants to make sure that what he's got, everything figured out, what he's laid out is still working, and he's pretty excited that the church is doing well. He, he sends Timothy to make sure it's okay. He gets the good news back, and he's like, right on. Bring on the persecution. Nobody asked for that. There's, nobody asked for that. But Paul, Paul got persecuted pretty bad, right? So when you give yourself you're giving yourself to love and serve other people. It's tough. They're people. But you still, that's our call, is to love and serve other people. Not only does this influence the, and make difference in lives, but the process in it is life to life. So now we didn't just do a face to face, we're life to life. And then there's truth in love. When, when you love someone, Timothy's return back, he says, listen, we're greatly encouraged. He got this great thing. Until Timothy returned, both of them really were concerned with what was going on with the church, but they get word back that it's all good. That's what we want. We want to make sure that it's all good. So when you have a problem, we work on the problem, and then it's good. Does it go away? No, but we really need to work together to do that. That's why we continue to meet. That's why we continue to do face-to-face -face time. We can come up with a lot of excuses to not do it, but we're going to be blessed if we, if we actually do it, right? Now, in, in 1 Thessalonians 3.10, it says, Night and day we pray earnestly for you and ask God to let us see you again and fill the gaps of your faith. So how do we fill those gaps? We talked about it. We want to be there for each other. When your faith is down, reach out to someone whose faith isn't. I, I, I tell people all the time, my phone's on 24-7, and it is. I'll pick it up and call if, if I'm available and not working or whatever, but I will return the call because the biggest thing as a leader is we want to make sure that if there are any gaps, that we can step in and help. And we, we're only going to do this through him and we'll pray about it and we'll, we'll pray for you and we'll get those gaps filled because we really want to make sure that we address shortcomings. The funny thing is, is Paul's pretty good at this too. He addresses shortcomings. And, and in the letter it says, you know, I see some shortcomings. And I need, we need to address it. Now, that's never a call that you want from your boss. Where you go, hey, you know, I, I just want to sit down and, and I want to deal with your, your shortcomings. And you kind of go, mm -hmm. yikes. That, that's, that's where my head was the first time I preached in front of Pastor Mike. I was like, he's just going to bring up all my shortcomings. Which he didn't, right? What did he do? He encouraged me. And he says, look, this is good. This, is, this could make it better. Oh, yeah, you're right. It can make it better. And the, that's the key is, is that we want to make it better. So it's, and it's how you receive it and how you look at this ultimately, right? You're going to receive these things in love. You're going to get good at saying, hey, I want to step in and fill the gap for you. I want to make sure that I got you down. I, I want to make sure that everything's good. Now, do we fail to disciple? Sure we do. Sure we do. I got a challenge for you coming up. Do we do? We fail to do it. Nevaeh, you can come up. As we start kind of closing this and wrapping this up together, the, the thing that I want you to do is just take a minute, and, and we're just going to take a minute as Nevaeh plays, and I, I want God to speak to you, who can I disciple? It's pretty easy. 
Now, there's no blame for the, the empty chairs, but I pray for the empty chairs every single day. There's not. But I want you to think, who can I disciple? Who can I encourage to come to church? Who can I encourage to get plugged into whatever it is that needs to be plugged into? And we're just going to take a second. Nevaeh is going to play. We, we ultimately, we want God to speak truth to us, right? We also want him to cue in to us if there's somebody we can speak to. You, you've all heard the Christianese thing that you may be the only Bible that someone reads. And that's, and, and really, some of the best things that have ever happened to me, I speak, on, I speak in conferences, and I spoke at a Washington radiology conference. When I got done, I went to the back, and I was sitting in the back, and this lady walks up, and she goes, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said nothing about Jesus in my whole thing. And I was like, yeah, because I could tell. <laughs> that you want to have for people, right? And then when they can tell, you just want to share it. You want to go, yeah, no, God works great in my life. Um, are there going to be tough times? There's going to be tough times. That's why people need shoulder time. They need that one-to-one -one time in discipleship. It's really important to do. So I just want to take just a minute. It's going to be really quiet. I want you to close your eyes. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. Nobody even has to raise their hand. I just want you to close your eyes. And I want you to pray this. Lord, who can I disciple this week? Now, it may be someone that's been in your life last week. It may be somebody that's been in your life for a long time. And I just want you to pray about it. And I want you to just take a minute, pray about it. Okay, now here's where the rubber meets the road. Write down their name. Write it down. You don't have to do it right after church. You don't have to do it, but I really want you to reach out to somebody and say, listen, God laid you on my heart. And is there something that I can do to fill the gap? That was a big promise keepers thing. They, they did a whole, a whole series on standing in the gap. And that's what he calls us to do, is stand in the gap, to intercede for those people. So write their name down and, and invite someone to church and say, listen, we got a lot of empty seats and we want the empty seats to be full. This is, this is 180 seats, folks. 180 seats, two services, 180 seats. I think people are broken in need of a savior. And I think touching them in love and in, in just genuine, hey, I want you to see what we got. And it's not programs. That's not it. It's people. I want to introduce you to someone. I, I want them to shake your hand. I want you to see that, you know, I love Isaac. Isaac loves me. We can just, you know, wrap our arms around each other and say hi to each other, right? In manly ways. With a grunt. In a manly way. Yeah. So, um, I, just, just really being face to face with them is really the opportunity that you have. You, you don't have to speak Christianese to anybody, but you can say, "Hey, I think you might be hurting. Can I pray for you?" And it, it can be short and hot, as Pastor Mike calls it. It can be just, "Lord, I just want to pray for this situation." And look, I get it. You may not feel qualified. You are qualified. You may not feel qualified. And Satan's snare, the biggest one is that name that you wrote down for you not to look at it during the week. And I'm praying that you look at those names, that you, that you reach out to those people. It's really important. It's super important that you reach out to them because people are hurting today. And we have an answer, and it's good news. It's not bad news. It's good news. And that's the gospel, right? And that's how the gospel is going to work through discipleship is that you're just sharing good news. They're going to see that you're excited. No, I'm not asking you to not genuinely be excited, but I am asking you to care and love on people. It, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard and it takes time. I, I honestly, the first time I met Jeff, he made me angry. I'm being honest and he knows what it's about. I didn't get to sit where I wanted to sit and I was angry. 
And then I went through, I went through, and I, it, honestly, one of the Satan's snares going through Rooted was, I don't want to go through Rooted with Jeff. Sorry, Jeff, I love you. So, and by the time Rooted was done, I developed a genuine relationship that's long and lasting with Jeff. And it was worth those Thursday nights and those Saturdays of just getting those relationships together. Invite them to coffee, it's cheap. How you doing? Genuinely love on them. Give them good news. Because in today, you turn on the news and there is no good news. But guess what? You turn on love and you are the good news. You can do it. You, you are qualified to get this thing done. And you do not have to, obviously I got tongue twi twisted while I was reading the scriptures, but you don't have to like, thus saith the Lord people. You just have to say, I'm here. I'm here. And it's a genuine thing. So I just want to take one second, just heads down, eyes closed, nobody looking around. If you don't know the Jesus that I'm telling you about that has good news, we want to be there for you. Can you just take a second and slip your hand up and I'll see you? Amen. Now, if you want help being a disciple and you want me to pray for you, raise your hand. Yeah, hands up all over the place. Father, we love you. We can't do this without you. We ask that you just anoint these people to be qualified. Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ that you not step into these, that you not throw snares out. And if they see your snares, they just step onto the side because they're obvious. We give you the praise. We thank you so much that we're able to be here with you and to be disciples and to learn the good news in your name.